which is ping pong parachute. Now, I wanted to remind you of the video that I shown you in the first, um, let's say, in the first build workshop. So we'll watch 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds of this video. Little Rock Central High School, second launch. Timer's ready? Yep. yep. Three, two, one, go. It would be a one liter bottle that is carbonated water, uh, a ping pong ball, and some means of getting the ping pong ball to stay in the air as long as possible. Three, two, and one. We wanted to put the ping pong ball. So what you saw there was a couple of failed launches and one really successful one. Um, From Illinois, first launch. Sorry. So why are these rockets all failing? And why is the rocket with the long tube attached so successful? Uh, would you, I would like to ask you people in the chat, try to answer this question or just type something in. Why, why do you think? Uh, those th those rockets were successful or not successful. Hmm. Okay, no, the long tube had a nice parachute and it started higher up. Okay, wait, wait a second. The long tube had a nice parachute and it started higher up, but it may have affected how high the whole rocket went. Okay, well, um, most they had more or less the same parachute. It was all kind of like a trash bag. There weren't any holes in it. It was just plain bag. Okay, the long tube gave the ball additional height. I'm glad you noticed. And um, that's true. Yes, it did give us some additional height, but uh, so I, I thought that the question is really more to do with the parachute, and I'll explain to you why why so. Even so, so really, the extra one or two feet that the tube offered wouldn't do much. It would only add, like, wouldn't do much to save the parachutes that failed. Because if you observe here, like, look at this. This parachute, um, it didn't even unfold. So it was kind of crumpled. And any amount of height that you offer it wouldn't do enough to help it go high enough. So it would be essentially the point of the the point of this event is to how do we ensure that the parachute reaches the maximum height and deploys quickly? Because we can toss the parachute up to any height. We can have a really, really long two, but if the parachute is crumpled and it remains crumpled as it falls down, then it won't act as a parachute. It will be a crumpled trash bag falling down um really quickly so that's what i wanted to emphasize with this event it's about the parachute now the rocket does play an important role and this is a good looking rocket it does have a long nose tube in here so uh essentially this nose tube does add a little bit of height it adds one or two feet but these rockets fly pretty high up anyways they fly maybe several meters so two feet won't do much what they do instead is they keep the parachute in a position that's very easy to unfold. So I guess um, I'll, I'll, I'll click this link um, and I'll show you. So this person, um, this person has a channel dedicated to these types of builds. And notice how they have the same long tube rocket um, and that's their brand on phase. So, the way you put this rocket, the parachute on the rocket is somewhat something like this. So observe how the way it's attached now, once the rocket falls down, the parachute is essentially almost open already. So that's the secret of why you need a long tube to keep it up or why this long tube is successful. So I wanted to get that, um, I guess, misconception out of the way. So it's about getting the parachute to deploy faster. And these rockets can fly pretty high. In fact, they can hit the wall. So you need to avoid hitting the wall because uh, otherwise, as soon as you hit the wall, the time stops. So you are you want to maximize the amount of time that your, air, your ping pong ball spends in the air. 
if you hit the ceiling, it stopped. So you can uh, basically that's bad. Now, so if it's about the parachute, then how are you supposed to design the parachute to maximize the amount of time the descent of descent? Interestingly, or maybe even ironically, parachutes with holes fly, or fall down slower. And this is because when your parachute falls down, once it fills up, if it has no holes, it will fill up quickly and it will stop kind of catching new air. So um, to catch more air and slow down, it will have to compress the air inside of the parachute already. And uh, that essentially slows down the amount, the descent or the, the rate at which you can break against the air. So these holes, they will essentially, they allow air, slow moving air to fly out of the parachute and keep absorbing a new stream of fast moving air as the um, person or the ping pong ball falls down. Now keep in mind that there are holes not only in the very top, which I guess is kind of a classical um, place to put a hole, but also in the sides. And the holes on the sides, what they do is they help you maintain some sort of stability. Because if the airplane falls down and there's a gust of wind that pushes the, the parachute or the person to the side, what will happen is that you have the parachute here and the person. The person is pushed a little bit this way to the side, but the parachute is also tilted with the person and it's continuing to fall down. What happens is if it's tilted sideways, it will, it will want to fold. And if it folds, then it's not acting as a parachute. It's basically acting as a rag that's flailing in the air because if it falls this way, then it will get pushed that way and then that way. And notice how the parachute is collapsed. So that's why you need the holes. It's for stability. And this is so important that they have this going even in the military here. This is a military uh, parachute that the United States uses. So even though it's ironic, adding holes will decrease the descent rate in a parachute. So that's why I encourage you to experiment with different parachute designs because that's really the, the, the best, the most important thing in this event is the parachute. Um, yeah, I find it amusing that you can be very successful at this event uh, by building things out of just trash because all you need is a Coca-Cola bottle, maybe a, a trash bag, a couple of scrap paper, maybe some tape, and that's all you need for this event. Um, so uh, it's, I guess it's cheaper than the other events in terms of um, material costs, but it's, all, it's still fun nonetheless, because these, all of the adjustments that you can make are very quick and simple. So it's really teaching you to optimize and find the best um, out of a, a vast pool of solutions, which is what aerospace is about in the first place. Either way, um, this year, you're limited to a 20 ounce bottle, which holds 50 pounds per square inch uh, uh, of pressure. That's the maximum pressure you can uh, pump it up to. Uh, you're, I would recommend using masking tape instead of the cellophane packing tape I had here previously, because masking tape is easier to work with, easier to cut. Um, and yeah, maybe you can also try using sewing thread and cardstock instead of uh, thick poster board and heavy string as I had here previously to save some weight. Um, and now I, I wanted to, so you might be confused or might not know what this long tube was, or yeah, so what are you supposed to make this thing out of? So. It so happens that uh, we use these tubes as some sort of packaging material for compact fluorescent lamps, or sorry, for fluorescent lamps. The one that are in the form of long tubes and you usually see them in the office. So people make these tubes to house these lamps. And if you buy them, they're called T12 fluorescent tube guards in plastic. And if you click on this link, you'll find a place where you can buy it. And by searching similar terms, you can find many more similar products online. So, uh, that's that. Um, I guess I didn't know that these things existed until uh, someone told me so. Now I'm telling you. Now, we have all of these materials and you'd say, huh, well, okay, I know all I need is like a piece of tape, but really, what if I want, or what if I want to use something fancy? Let's say I want to use metal wires to, I don't know, attach the fins to the Coca-Cola bottle, or I don't know, what if I want to like, I don't know, do stuff more. 
than just with these supplies. Well, unfortunately, there are quite a bit of limits in this event. So the next thing I want to mention is that there are several forbidden materials or things forbidden that will disqualify you essentially if um, if you do. So any modifications to that carbonated beverage bottle uh, is uh, not allowed. And that's primarily for safety because if you drill a hole in it then or or if you kind of melt the bottle, then if the bottle could explode essentially after your modifications. And they don't want to like have people bringing in stuff that explodes and potentially um, harming others, uh, the participants and the competitors. Um, and it's also to establish a level of fairness. So everyone has more or less the same things to start out with, the same Coca-Cola bottle that they're using. Um, so the way you're not allowed to modify it, the bottle, the only thing you're allowed to do is attach things to it with tape. So no glue gun. You can't sand the water bottle to shave off some weight. You can't paint anything. You can't drill holes. Um, and you can't use metal anywhere on this rocket which I found this a very interesting constraint, but no metals, so no screws, no bolts, no nuts, no wires. Um, and you're not allowed to use any energy sources except for the air that you pump into the rocket. So I know that there are a, a car, soda bottle rockets that you pour water inside of them first before pressurizing them with air, and that way they can fly really high up. Um, so... We're not allowed to use water here. It will make a big splash. This is all indoors. And yeah, so you're not allowed to use any remote controls or elastic flight assist. I found that found that term very interesting. What do they mean by this elastic flight assist? But either way, um, if you want to look at the rules here, you can click a link. Uh, this is publicly available um, website that you can try and have very similar rules to the 2022 events, which have not been yet released, but there's a trial version uh, being circulated. now. How are you going to launch this rocket? I, I want to show you a video of how a launcher looks like and essentially how does this trial look like in um <laughs> assembling this and you know wrapping things up but that's how launcher looks like and this is one of many designs uh i have one here um on loan to, to me from so i think you're supposed to put the rocket here on this nozzle and then this thing will kind of clip onto it so you know how uh bottles they have a little neck sorry bottles have a little neck here and essentially, this thing is supposed to clip onto that neck, and it will prevent it from flying off when, even if it's under pressure. So something like that. Hopefully, you can see how there's a little rim here, and this thing clips onto that rim. And if you, I try to pull on it, it, it won't try to go away. So that's what you can use too. You can use this too. So I'm not sure how much this costs. Uh, this one I showed you apparently is expensive. It's like $100, but you can build your own for like $30.
And you can visit the SIULE forums for instructions on a DIY, um, how do you say this? Yeah, DIY launcher. Sorry, I want to do something more. Quick. All right, so that was the launcher. Oh dear, so I, I we've summarized quite a bit of things here. I've shown you, um, I've shown you several uh, pre uh, previous competitors, how they are successful or not successful and why. I've shown you uh, how, what a good design looks like and what are some things you need to watch out for and what you need to work on. And finally, I've told you about the materials that you can and can't use and how to launch this device. So now I want to wrap this all together in a sort of like procedural approach on what you need to do from start to finish or from your from reading the rules to your competition is first things first you need to observe some existing designs what have people already done so i keep saying this but don't reinvent the wheel if there is a good design there already just use it uh so uh in fact you can make improvements on this design and contribute something new to the world um and basically in the process of doing this background research, uh, you need to seek good ideas and understand why others fail. And you, you should probably keep a log of like successful approaches and unsuccessful approaches. So uh, the next step is to obtain your materials and obtain more materials than you think you'll need because you might break something or you run out, uh, need replacements. So get some materials. Uh, now, once you've built your rocket you've made some i guess design and you've slapped it together with tape and glue gun next step is to test and record how the test went so the things so this event also requires you to use to submit a flight log or practice log and you're supposed to include uh, several parameters such as the pressure that you launch it the launch height so how high the rocket goes up and the amount of time that the parachute spends falling down Now, uh, the other thing you can use things you can record for this event are the amount of time it takes to um, for the rocket to deploy, the rocket mass, and the fin area. Sorry, I'll need to mute for real quick. Okay, I'm sorry. There was a, a really loud car driving by, so I decided to mute while it was driving past. Anyways, that's over now. Uh, now, you, for example, you've made some sort of, you've made a couple test runs. You've made a couple recordings where, let's say, you changed the pressure and you observed how the launch height and the parachute descent time are affected by this. Uh, the next step is to make inferences and optimize your rocket to increase the parachute time and the ways you can the things you can change are that are under your control that will affect how long your parachute will fly are is the parachute designed where you place the holes how big are the holes are the material that it's made out of the and maybe the, the shape of the parachute uh, and perhaps maybe even the rocket design so how many fins do you have uh, how long is that tube at the front and so you can change these things. In fact, one thing I forgot to comment is that you can, I recommend you experiment with different trash bags as well, because uh, let's say one trash bag is like heavy duty and it's very thick, uh, but the other trash bag is super light, uh, but it's too small for your purposes. Or So try different things. Trash bags are cheap. Uh, you can make, mis making a mistake is really, really cheap here. And so, uh, once you, and, and I guess another comment I can make is the tube length. Why would you want to optimize that? Isn't it the longer, the better? Well, actually, if you, if you make this tube too long, what could happen is that the center of mass will be far away from the rocket itself. So it's like, imagine you have a rocket here and it's pushing a very heavy stick at the top. So here's your tube. And if the tube is very long, it will be heavy. So, and the center of mass will be somewhere here already, so above the rocket's body. 
So you have the rocket launching, but if this tube is heavy and if the rocket tilts a little bit, what would happen is it will fall down because this thing is really heavy. It's kind of the same reason why it's hard to balance heavy objects on your finger because it wants to fall down all the time. So best avoid that. Make Don't make it too long. This rocket here is about two feet long. Um, that seems to work well for that person. So try, try that length out, maybe something smaller and shorter. See where that takes you. And finally, once you get to the competition, uh, <laughs> well, I guess good luck. I hope that you've, uh, hopefully you've been preparing for that well enough. But after the competition, take a moment to think about how it happened and what could you do better next time. And maybe even if this is your last competition, um, it's probably not your last competition for in, in life, but and the lessons that you learn will be applicable to other things. So take some time to reflect. Um, yeah. Now, uh, some important tips for success before we move on. It's um, you need to have a gym to practice. So, and you need to practice a lot. So hopefully you would have access to a gym or some sort of large flying space, not outdoors, because if the wind blows, your precious airplane, which you spent $70 and countless hours building, would get blown into the trees and it will break. Speaking of which, uh, your airplane, the right stuff, or your ping pong parachute could break. I mean, they are flying to a very tall height and they could fall down. So in that case, be prepared to have, uh, be prepared at the competition, bring spares. You're allowed to bring two right stuff airplanes and three rockets in case something breaks. Um, Yes, so that's kind of the warnings. Uh, now, I guess now I wanted to move on to the fun stuff. Oh, I mean, parachutes, they seem kind of boring old. Like, okay, we've had parachutes for hun like 100 years or maybe 200 years. Like, who cares? Well, um, I wanted to show you maybe seven minutes worth of YouTube videos that will kind of inspire you to treat this event seriously and understand why the lessons you learn here will be important later on. So we'll watch this video first and then this video. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought, but it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over. We slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When 
opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping nine Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane in the river. 20 meters above the surface, you have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. So yeah, we, we recently launched another Mars rover, this YouTube video is back from 2012, but I think they used the same design this year as well. Now, before they came up with this parachute, they've actually done a lot of testing and testing that will remind you of nothing other but this event, Ping Pong Parachute. High above the eastern shore of Virginia, a rocket is hurtling through the atmosphere at nearly twice the speed of sound. Attached is a 3,000 pound payload that is designed to test a parachute for Mars. On board, a computer is calculating the altitude and speed to determine the precise time that it will signal to deploy the parachute. These aren't the first tests of parachutes for Mars. 50 years ago, NASA began lofting parachutes to altitudes and speeds meant to simulate the conditions of Mars entry. Those early tests demonstrated the challenges of inflating lightweight materials in a 1,500 mile an hour wind and having them survive well enough to help enable a safe landing on the red planet. Today, as our missions become ever more daring, we need new parachutes capable of surviving those strenuous environments, and we need ways of testing them at loads higher than ever before. To make those tests a reality, engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory worked with NASA's Wallops Flight Facility to develop a new test technique, the Advanced Supersonic Parachute Inflation Research Experiments, or ASPIRE project, uses a two-stage Black Brant 9 sounding rocket to carry its payload to the conditions needed to stress the parachute. The rocket is launched out over the Atlantic Ocean and ascends to altitudes where the atmosphere of Earth mimics the atmosphere near the surface of Mars. The third and final ASPIRE test launched on September 7th. The parachute was deployed at nearly twice the speed of sound in less than half a second, 200 pounds of nylon, Kevlar, and Technora go from a small drum-sized bag with the density of wood to an inflated parachute with the volume of a large house, generating nearly 70,000 pounds of drag. Here, in slow motion images, you can see the rapid emergence of the parachute as it begins generating the drag crucial for deceleration at Mars. These images give us amazing insights into the physics and early behaviors of a supersonic parachute inflation. The apparent ease of the unfurling and unfolding in the parachute belies the severity of the extreme environment in which this occurs. Awaiting below were a recovery team who had retrieved both the parachute and the payload and returned them to shore. 
The parachute was then meticulously rinsed and hung to dry before inspection. Miles and miles of thread and over three million stitches are used to hold the parachute together. And we will examine each stitch. After three successful tests of Aspire, NASA has now tested their new parachute at loads and conditions exceeding any large supersonic parachute before it and 40% higher than the highest load expected for the Mars 2020 mission. Our parachute is now certified for flight at Mars. So, I hope that now you can appreciate, uh, you, you now know what this event is about, what steps you need to take to be successful, and why it's important to this world to have this set of knowledge.